Hello out there. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy day to join us as we dive into the topic of cats, birds, and animal shelters finding common ground. Before we jump in, I'd like to take a moment to thank Maddie's son for sharing their platform with us, with all of us, so that we might gather here today and share ideas. I wonder if Maddie would have ever guessed all the places her spirit would touch, all the lives she would play a part in saving, or all the webinars about cats and now birds she would make possible. Thank you, Maddie. No dog has ever done more for her furred or feathered friends. Okay, before we get started, I just want to make two quick announcements about the Q&A session happening directly after this webinar. In order to respect your time, we'd like to hold all your questions and comments until the very end when we can open the discussion up for everyone. But that does not mean you should wait until the end to ask. You'll forget. Send in your questions and comments as they come to you, and we'll queue them up for Dr. Hurley. And remember, if you're thinking it, so is someone else. Please don't be shy. And on that note, please don't be shy about anything. If you have an opinion that is different, don't be afraid to say so. This space was created as a launching place from which all parties and opinions are welcome. After this presentation and Q&A, we'll be continuing the conversation in the Million Cat Challenge discussion group, which is now hosted on the Maddie's Pet Forum. If you haven't already joined the Million Cat discussion group, do it now so you're ready to go after the webinar. Visit www.milliongatchallenge.org forward slash forum to find out the details about joining. Okay, without further ado, please allow me to introduce your presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Kate Hurley. As many of you know, Dr. Hurley is the co-founder of the Million Cat Challenge and the director of the UC Davis Crutch Shelter Medicine Program. Yes, she has extra hours in her day. Uh, Eighteen years ago, she was the first shelter medicine resident in the world, and just three years ago, she became one of the very first veterinarians to be boarded in shelter medicine. But none of these credentials are actually what brought her here today. I'll let Dr. Hurley tell you why she's decided to step in the ring of the ongoing, quote, war of bird v. cat. Take it away, Dr. Hurley. Thanks so much, Mandy. Hopefully you can all hear me well. Hello to all of you out there in webinar land, present and future, listening to this as a recording or listening to this live. And also I want to let you know I have the privilege of speaking to some UC Davis students who have come to join me live in a little conference room so that I don't have the strangeness of speaking into my office or into the air. Um, it has the disadvantage, though, that I couldn't do this in my pajamas. Um, and I just want to thank you all for being here. I'm conscious of what a privilege it is to have a full hour of everybody's time in this busy, busy world that we all live in these days. And in particular, I want to thank those who had the courage to come here today wondering if they would hear something that would challenge what they already believe about this issue. I know how scary that can be because I myself have found myself on very different sides of this issue at different times in my own life. So I think we can all agree, no matter where we're coming from, there's strong feelings on all sides. And if you look at these headlines, you can feel like it's impossible that all these different viewpoints could be legitimate or could be expressed by fundamentally good people. But if you think about the impulse that animates all of this concern, it's fundamentally a very positive impulse, isn't it? It's an impulse to protect the vulnerable, which is really at the core of what makes us human and what makes us humane. It's the reason why we stand up for, to protect the environment. It's the reason we stand up to protect children. It's the reason we stand up on the bus when we see someone who's struggling and could use our seat. It's not an impulse that we would want to ever eliminate. And yet, when we have such an important question before us with such wide-ranging implications for both humans and animals, it's really important that we make an effort to step back and let reason as well as passion and emotion inform the choices that we make.
So I want to start with just a question of where you and the audience are coming from or where you're coming from even if you're watching this or listening to this after the fact. This might not be relevant right now in your day-to-day -day life, but I can guarantee you that there are people listening to this webinar who had to confront these questions in a very real way this morning before lunch with life and death implications for cats. So here are the questions. If you had to make the decision right now, what would you choose? Would you euthanize a cat if you knew it would protect the life of a bird? Would you save a cat's life if you knew it would cost the life of a bird? Can you not decide? Can you not make such a choice? And so you would simply let nature take its course? Or do you believe there's really no choice to be made there? And go ahead and click on your screen, um, not in the question and answer box. And I'll give everybody a few ch seconds to think about that. Okay, let's see. And I guess we see where this audience is coming from. Not very many would choose to euthanize a cat if they knew it would protect the life of a bird. Um, about a quarter of the people would save a cat's life, even at the cost of the life of a bird. About half the audience is where I think a lot of people actually land. No matter how passionately you feel about this in theory, when it comes time to take action, it's really hard to make a decision to take the life of either animal. And about 20% refuse to believe that there's any choice to be made. And I'll tell you where I came from, and this is what Mandy was referring to. This is not related to me being the first shelter medicine resident in the world, or to me being the first person, one of the first people to be boarded in shelter medicine. It really relates back to the six years I spent as an animal control officer in Santa Cruz, which is perched on the edge of the Monterey Bay, which happens to be home also to sea otters, which since I was four years old is my favorite species other than cats. And we did wildlife rehabilitation as well as animal control and sheltering services in Santa Cruz. And I was the one who picked up the birds and the little critters who were injured and killed by cats. And a big part of my job, and one that I really believed in deeply, was to go out and set traps, go out and collect the cats in those traps, bring them back in a wire cage just like the one I'm holding in this picture. And if the cat was too fearful for me to set it up in a cage and vaccinate it, I personally took that cat straight back to euthanasia, shook her to the bottom of that wire carrier, and gave her a lethal injection as kindly as I knew how. I did that hundreds and thousands of times in the heartfelt belief that it was the best thing I could do to protect the welfare of cats that were not adapted to living in the wild and to protect the welfare of all the creatures that lived in the Monterey Bay. That's what I believed. I was willing to take the life of a cat, because I believed it would spare the life of a bird. That's a hard thing to say. And I'm sure there are some in this audience who are shocked by that. But I think we can all agree on, no matter where we're coming from or what we've done, it is our obligation to set that aside and make management decisions, both in the United States and globally, based on research about practices that will actually work. Whether we want that to be the case or not, we need to look at what does the evidence actually tell us. And so here's where I am now. I'm at UC Davis, one of the top veterinary medical schools in the whole world. And I have access to an amazing library. And this is just a screenshot of a tiny fraction 
of my reference library with all the articles that I've accumulated about the supposed conflict between cats and birds and different options for control. And also for 18 years, I've had the opportunity to travel the country and the world and look at what's actually happening. What are the real world efforts that are being made to address this problem and how are they playing out? And with all of that, coming from where I came from, I have now come to the absolute certainty that there is no choice that we can possibly make. There is no way that by taking the life of a cat, we can protect birds on a broad scale in the United States, in the communities that we actually live in. Nor do I believe there is any large-scale program that would protect cats that would actually end up having a negative impact on bird populations in the continental United States. And I'm going to spend the rest of this hour showing you how I've come to that conclusion. And I invite you to challenge me on every single point because it's so important that we actually get this right. Here's what we know about cat predation. And I want you to know, you can get the access to the slide notes in your resources button in the webinar. And I've put enough information in all of these slides that if you Google, you can find the original of all the articles that I will reference. So there are studies that, that have estimated this at a variety of levels, but a large study that aggregated a bunch of different studies came to the conclusion that cats kill an annual 1.3 to 4 billion birds in the United States alone, the medium of about 2.5 billion birds. And we know that cat predation has caused or contributed to at least 33 extinctions on islands, and there's been documented local reduction of endangered species in fragmented mainland habitats where that's been seen, and no matter what the population level impact, spend a day as an animal control officer, if your shelter does wildlife rehab, and the individual impact is indisputable. Cats injure and kill birds and small critters every day. And it's not just birds. In fact, multiple studies that have documented that birds make up only about 10% of cat prey. Cats are really adapted to hunt rodents. Um, and their estimated annual impact, this is from the same study, Loss et al., that I referenced that was um, on the previous slide. The estimated annual impact in the U.S. is median of 12.3 billion. And what that means is that it's actually a complex situation because we also know that there are invasive rats and rodents present throughout North America. And rats are very significant predators of eggs and nestlings. And they don't take that nestling and drop it on our living room floor. So we don't experience the injuries and the harm and the killing caused by rats in the way that we do with cats, but it's just as real in the impact that it has on vulnerable bird populations. And so in fact, paradoxically, because they're more adapted to hunt rodents than they are to hunt birds, they may actually have a net benefit for birds when both cats and rats are present as they are throughout North America, including Hawaii. And this is a quote from some Australian scientists who admit they hate cats. <laughs> they didn't want to find this. But their research concluded that native mammals were most likely to die off on islands that had rats, but not cats. And so in fact, when we think to eliminate cats, when we create programs designed at eliminating cat populations, we are taking a risk that may not, not only may not benefit birds, it may actually dramatically harm birds. So even if it were possible, it's not clear that it would be benign. And this is a quote from that paper, and I actually can't see it with my glasses here, so you'll have to read it. Um, a conservation implication is that eradication of introduced apex predators from islands could precipitate the expansion of rat populations, potentially leading 
to extinction of native mammal species. When we fool around with these complex systems, we are playing with fire. And here's how that played out on one small island, 11 square miles, starting with a population of about 150 cats. These efforts began in 1968 with 36 cats being trapped, infected with panleukopenia, and re-released onto the island to spread the disease. That resulted in the die-off of about 80% of the cats. But with 20% of the cats left, the habitat remaining, and the food source unchanged, what happens? The cats bred back to the carrying capacity of the island. And within four years, the population of cats had been restored. Over the subsequent years, about five years, but culminating in 1980, over 37,000 leg hold trap nights and over 26,000 poison baits put out. And the picture you see in the upper right corner of your screen is from the article that I read about this successful effort. And it shows a leg hold trap. And then I actually, when I was preparing this presentation, I went and looked up a picture of what a leg hold trap really looks like. And it was so gruesome that I couldn't bear to include it in this presentation. But I think you can sense just from the words that I've said, just from the simple description of this, the suffering, the pain, and the effort that was involved in eradicating the cats. But they were gone. And then what happened? From one in test three nestlings surviving with cats and rats, we went to one in 10 nestlings surviving with rats, but no cats. So the other picture is a helicopter picking up tons of rat bait to distribute across the island. And after 55 tons of rat bait was dropped by helicopter and hunting and elimination of some of the rats by do trained dogs, finally rats were eliminated, and then more than one in two, two nestlings survived. So it was a successful effort. It did protect the birds. But it took a lot, right? So done right, done comprehensively, and in a situation where additional immigration of predators can be excluded, like an island or a fenced-in area, it can work. And here are some pictures of the faces that we don't see every day in animal shelters, just to remind us that these lives also have value. These are some actual animals that have been protected by cat eradication. And so we might say, like, yes, it was painful. It was expensive. It took a long time. But it preserved these precious species who had nowhere else to go. And so it was worth it. But done right takes a lot. And I'll go back to this paper several times. This is just about successful eradication efforts on islands and on average, each successful campaign included, employed 2.7 eradication methods, including leg hole traps in almost 70%, hunting in almost 60%, and primary poisoning in 30%, and cage traps in 29%, and dogs. So these are expensive, intensive, and honestly brutal efforts that would not be practical in communities where people and pets are also present. The cost ranged from almost, um, oh, I'm missing some, <laughs> $26 to over $2,500 per hectare. And there's 259 hectares in a square mile, so you can do that math. These are expensive efforts. So it's practical on a small scale. It's beneficial, but we have to choose our circumstances. When we take this from the 11 square miles of Little Barrier Island to the 3.8 million square miles of just the United States, what are some options that would actually be financed and tolerated and practical? So one approach is to sterilize cats. 
educate the community, pass laws restricting free-roaming cats, adopt out the cats that are free-roaming, and make sure that people keep their cats confined. Or we could engage in a massive trap-neuter return campaign, or we could employ euthanasia or other means of lethal control. Those are the options I could think of besides just doing nothing and letting nature take its course. Interested to think if other people have other ideas for practical things we could do on a national scale. So let's look at each of these options. Less is more is a, is a concept that was developed by the animal sheltering and animal welfare, so pet companion animal welfare profession in the 70s that stood for legislate, educate, and sterilize. And really it has been animal shelters and animal welfare that has spearheaded the effort to reduce dog and cat overpopulation through increasing access and awareness of spay and neuter. And it's been very effective in terms of increasing spay-neuter rates for pet cats. Um, and you can see the progression from 80% in 2009 and in the early 90s to nearly 90% nationwide today. And in fact, consistently in every survey that I'm aware of, cats are sterilized at a higher rate than dogs are. And we've also made really significant progress, again, spearheaded for the most part by animal welfare organizations, although also wildlife protection um, groups have, have promoted these efforts. From the 1960s, where kitty litter was invented and it became sort of practical to coexist with a cat that will poop in your plants otherwise, um, uh, about 20% of cats in the 70s being kept indoors to over 65% in more recent studies. So there was a really significant reduction in cat births with over 90% of cats sterilized and in cats free roaming out and about. So you would think this would be reflected in fewer cats being brought into shelters year by year over time. And as true, it worked really well for dogs. We saw dramatic reductions in dog intake over recent decades into animal shelters. But in several states that published statewide shelter intake data, we saw something disturbing. From 1996 to 2004, Dog intake and euthanasia, which is the blue and the red bars respectively in Ohio, went down dramatically while cat intake and euthanasia crept up. Colorado, cat intake and euthanasia crept, went up dramatically while dog intake went down and euthanasia remained the same. In California, the largest state in the union, counting for about 12% of the population, we saw the exact opposite of the trend we want to see. Again, dog intake didn't change, went down a little euthanasia dropped dramatically, but cat intake and euthanasia, in spite of all our successes with spay-neuter, in spite of getting more than half the population to keep their cats indoors, it continued to go up and up and up year by year by year. What does this mean when this is the major investment that we're making in controlling this population? It's not working. Why? Here's the problem. It's estimated that there's between about 75 and 85 million pet cats in the United States. And from that same loss at all study that I referenced in the, bill, in the beginning, it's estimated that there's 30 to 80 million community cats. That is a population where we have no equivalent for dogs. So our legislate, educate, sterilize campaign, it reached pet owners, right? There's no cat that's going to escort itself into a spay and neuter clinic and be like, take me down. <laughs> I don't know what's good for me, but you do. <laughs> right? Cats don't follow a leash law. They don't follow a feeding ban. And so those efforts only impacted a population that makes up perhaps as little as half of the overall cat population. What happens when we reduce part of a population the remaining population breeds to the carrying capacity of the environment, just like on Little Barrier Island. When we have habitat and we have food and we have free-roaming breeding animals, they breed to capacity. So we have pet cats that are the target of spay-neuter, indoor cat communications, leash laws, and education. And then we have all the cats that are out and about in communities. And importantly, 
Although a lot of the controversy swirls around large colonies of cats that can aggregate and have an impact on local wildlife and create a lot of nuisance issues, less than 5% of free-roaming cats are part of colonies. The vast majority of free-roaming cats live in ones and twos and threes and fours in alleys and yards and behind dumpsters and behind restaurants and behind your and my house. So, if legislate, educate, and sterilize isn't the answer, and we want an answer that's not send out 35,000 poison traps and then dump rat bait from a helicopter, what about couldn't we just gather them all up and fence them in somewhere? And this has been tried too. This was an effort on a 23-square-mile island with 66 cats, and it's the largest such effort. And this went on from 2004 to 2011, so about seven years, with 236 live leg hold traps for over 30,000 trap nights and 54 camera traps for over 27,000 trap nights. And then there was just a few cats left, but you can't let even a few be left if there's still a habitat and still a food source, right, because we know what they'll do. Four final wily cats that would not go in any trap were tracked and killed by dogs. And then three cats were shot by hunters, the last of which was pregnant. So we see how intensive and complete these efforts have to be. That effort was $2.9 million plus $50,000 a year to operate the sanctuary for the cats that were confined as they've gradually friendlied up and been adopted out or died off. So, again, like eradication, this can work, but it's hard to scale. Largest successful eradication campaign ever achieved without poison was on a 23-square-mile island with 66 cats. Okay, so maybe we have to take that one off the table, as appealing as it might be. So what about trap, neuter, return? I think probably you're all familiar with this, where unowned cats are trapped, sterilized, usually vaccinated, and generally returned to the location found. Usually caretaker or cat advocate, advocate initiated. And historically, this has tended to target the larger and more visible colonies of cats because they're easier to identify and find and capture than all those cats that are existing out as ones and twos and threes in our community. And here are some things we know do work about trap, neuter, and return unrelated to the idea of eradicating cats. Improved feline health, so body condition score increased from four to five after trap, neuter, and return. And you can see that in, the, in sterilized cats. You can see them plump up. You can see it in your own cats. Median survival on site was seven years in one study. And these cats have better health and lower toxoplasmosis shedding rates than unmanaged feral cats. I'll get to that later on. It also enjoys the majority of public approval um, in various studies. Even people who don't like cats generally prefer this over lethal control as an option. And importantly, that means they're more likely to utilize services for management when it meets with their approval. If they don't believe in having cats euthanized and they are aware of cats that might be causing problems and breeding and creating some risk, and euthanasia is the only option, they're not going to do anything. So we want to give the public options that are palatable to them if we want cats controlled, even if we don't care about the cats themselves. And some nuisance abatement. Um, this is from the uh, Institute of City and County Managers Association. Maybe it's the International City and County Managers, Managers Association. Documenting significant decreases in complaint calls following pretty intensive trap, neuter, return campaigns in communities. So a lot of the complaints and nuisance behaviors associated with cats are associated with being intact, mating, and breeding. And here's what might work on a small scale about TNR. This is one documented study um, that took place from 1991 to 2002, a 2.2 square mile area, starting with about 155 cats, and importantly, the feeding was adjusted for the number of cats present. So unlike those other situations that I described, the carrying capacity of the habitat was sort of reduced in proportion to the number of cats. We didn't continue to attract and support new breeding cats. 
all the cats were captured and sterilized, about half the cats were adopted out, a few were relocated, and by 2010, there was only 11 cats remaining, and I believe that the population has continued to dwindle. And importantly also, this was performed by volunteers, so unlike those other multi-million dollar campaigns, there was no cost to taxpayers um, to accomplish this. So, yay, it's a win, but also it was 2.2 square miles. So what are the possibilities for scaling up from 2.2 square miles to 3.8 million? There are limits to TNR for eradication. This is from the same study that I showed earlier talking about successful methods and noting that contrary to complaints, claims by proponents, feral cats have not been eradicated from any island using trap, neuter, and return. And here's a reality check for all of us. This has been well analyzed. And mathematical models, as well as our experience, predict that you have to reach a certain proportion of cats through TNR in order to actually have the population dwindle to zero over time. And the estimates range from 57% to over 90%, depending on what the mathematical model included. But it's not a level when we think about 30 to 80 million free roaming cats in the United States that we could realistically achieve. And this is a critique from a paper noting, this is a program in Rome, the spay and neuter campaigns did bring about a general decrease in cat numbers, but then the percentage of in immigration was around 20% suggesting that without an effective education of people to control the reproduction of house cats as a prevention for abandonment, these campaigns are a waste of money, time, and energy. If they don't work, if we can't exclude additional immigration, it's a waste of money, time, and energy. And I agree that it is a waste of money, time, and energy if your goal is to eliminate cats to zero. But remember, of course, there are other significant benefits of trap, neuter, and return programs from a cat and public health and nuisance abatement perspective. But I want us to keep in mind the idea that things that aren't of sufficient scale and don't work are a waste of money, time, and energy. Keep that in mind. When we talk about if sanctuaries won't work and TNR won't work, what else can we do? And here's a simple statement from the Wildlife Society regarding feral and free-ranging domestic cats. To support and encourage the humane elimination of feral cat populations, including feral cat colonies, through adoption into indoor-only homes of eligible cats and humane euthanasia of unadoptable cats. And that's exactly what I did as an animal control officer, right? I brought the cats in. If they were friendly and I could set them up in a cage, I'd put them up for adoption. If they weren't, I'd take them to the back and I'd euthanize them myself. It's a clean sounding statement. When you ask what else should we do, we should have humane euthanasia through animal control programs. But what are we actually talking about when we advocate and even permit and fund that practice? I use the term euthanized out of respect for the intention of those who perform that act and out of respect for my own intention when that was my daily job. But if you look at the cats, and the cats on this slide are cats that were on their way to euthanasia, if you think about the experience of a feral and free-roaming animal being captured, being held in a noisy stainless steel cage with dogs barking and doors slamming and being shaken to the bottom of a wire carrier and given a lethal injection when you were perfectly healthy three days ago. It is not euthanasia in any sense that that word was ever intended. And it's not humane for animals 
or for the people who perform that act. The vast majority of this operate through animal control and sheltering programs. These are funded by donor dollars and taxpayer dollars designed to support and manage companion animal populations. And because cats are the species most frequently admitted to animal shelters, and until recently, euthanasia was the most common outcome at the vast majority of animal shelters in North America, this has been the significant, the largest single investment that we have made in control of this population. And it's not initiated scientifically based on which cats are most at risk and which cats are most likely to cause harm to wildlife populations. It's initiated by individual annoyed and concerned people because a cat is pooping in their garden, because it's cold outside and they're worried about the cat, and they don't know what else to do, and they bring it to an animal shelter thinking that's the right thing. And then the euthanasia is performed by shelter staff. What works about this? Does it help protect feline health? I believed it did when I was an animal control officer. I believed that feral cats would suffer when they were out and about on their own. But we already saw the benefits of trapping and neutering and returning them as a means to protect their health as an alternative. And even without that, we know that trapping is really targeted to the cats that are really at high risk of suffering because those aren't the ones that are in contact with our communities and that are coming into shelters in good body condition. We know that survival of semi-owned cats who have access to at least some food source is 90%. And we did a study here at UC Davis that documented the body condition score of free roaming cats admitted to our local shelter was a rock solid five out of nine, just what we would hope for for our own fat pets that are lounging home on the couch right now. It doesn't enjoy a public approval. In a national survey, less than 15% of the American public supports trap and kill. And in a 2012 national survey, 75% of Americans say shelters should kill only suffering or dangerous animals. And again, when we alienate the majority of the public from animal shelters that are our society's single largest response to free-roaming companion animal populations, then what do people do? They shy away from a system that has betrayed their beliefs, and they abandon cats to colonies instead because there's not a better option. So when we lose people's trust, it's not just the cats that pay a price. It's all the harms that are caused when cats are unmanaged and are abandoned. And, of course, nuisance abatement, it fails to address the inciting problem. You can take one cat away. But if there's still resources there and there's other cats there, the problem is going to recur. Um, but what about this? What about this? Must cats die so birds can live? Even if it doesn't help with cat health, even if it doesn't abate nuisances, even if most of the public doesn't approve, do we, as scientists, as the professionals, do we know better? Do we have to say, yes, cats should die so birds can live? And now I'm going to just take this out of the realm of cats and talk about a different species, but a really similar question, right? Coyotes, kill them or leave them alone? They're insatiable killers. Most important predator of sheep, goats, and cattle. Sounds familiar, right? Insatiable killers in our midst. Highly adaptable. The simulated population survived indefinitely when 70% of its members were killed annually. So just like cats, it takes a massive and sustained effort. If you kill 75%, a year for 50 years. Yes, you could get rid of them. And importantly, if you don't reach that threshold for control, if you do it for 49 years or only 
the coyote population will rebound. So this is from another article documenting that pack size and density rebounded to pre-removal levels within eight months post-removal. With increasing prey and reduced density, mean litter size doubled in the removal area. Litter-bearing mammals breed to the carrying capacity of the environment, no matter what you do. If there's 20 coyotes and you kill 10, or you rehome them in garden or working coyote homes, <laughs> the other 10 will quickly have 15 puppies. There's a saying in the coyote control circles, kill a coyote and two come to its funeral. And in fact, there's ways in which ineffective lethal control can cause harm. For one thing, by destabilizing the age structure, having a population with more juvenile animals, which actually can be more at risk of spreading disease, roaming and transmitting diseases across long distances, but also in the psychology of how it inhibits us from adopting techniques that actually might work better. And this is from another article about coyote control Discussing the possibility that livestock producers would have little incentive to adopt non-lethal um, methods to prevent depredation because lethal method methods are available, the false idea of having this lethal solution will stop people from trying non-lethal methods that actually might work. That's the theory of this author. And here's, interestingly, how it played out. Not far from us here in California, this was Marin County, and those hippies created a ban on killing coyotes. And here's a quote from a livestock producer. We've pretty much learned how to control coyotes on our own, said Jensen, whose losses to coyotes have declined 50 to 70, or 60 to 70% from about 50 lambs a year when a federal trapper worked there to 15 to 20 a day today. Anything that can help you 24 hours a day, like electric fencing, is a good thing. Electric fencing was invented decades before this ban on federal killing went into place. That farmer could have put up electric fencing any time, but he didn't do it until the false solution was taken away. So what do we not do? What do we not think about? What do we not invest in because we are investing in a false solution? So I'm sure you can see the parallels between two adaptable, prolific, and controversial populations. And so I think we really need to ask the question, not must cats die so birds can live, but can cats die so birds can live? Is there any possibility that we could possibly kill enough cats by any means available to have any benefit for bird populations on a community or continental scale? Here's the same reality check. It's the same papers that documented that there was a threshold for TNR. There's a lower threshold for euthanasia or removal. It really doesn't matter if you kill them or rehome them or euthanize them or put them in a sanctuary. At least 50% removal is required for eradication, and not just once, but sustained year after year after year, along with prevention of immigration. We have 30 to 80 million unowned cats and, additionally, owned cats that are outdoors in the United States and one to two million cats euthanized in U.S. shelters and declining rapidly. So we would need to scale that up 15 to 160 fold in order to actually eradicate cats by this means. Removal short of eradication has no benefit. It does nothing. In fact, it may even cause harm. We saw it with coyotes. Here's a study that was done a few years ago with cats. Contrary to expectation, this wasn't what the researchers were trying to achieve or show. The abundance and activity of feral cats increased in the cull sites 
by as much as 200% compared to pre- and post-culling periods and compared to equivalent sites where no culling was done. And this was intensive. This was much higher than could be achieved through the effort, the laissez-faire efforts that, ach- that occur around animal shelter programs. This was as much as 30% of the cats being trapped. They were scanned for a microchip, and if there was no microchip, they were shot in the head. So even at a higher level of control than what we could achieve, the result paradoxically was a destabilization of the age structure, more cats being born or immigrating to take advantage of the habitat that existed. So which one of these activities is a waste of money, time, and energy? On the left are cats in a TNR program. On the right are cats who on that day, at that moment, were being wheeled to the euthanasia room of an animal shelter where we were consulting. TNR improves feline health, reduces nuisance impact, and has widespread public support, and is not likely to eliminate cat populations on a large scale. Euthanizing cats at animal shelters does not improve feline health, does not reduce nuisance impact, does not enjoy widespread public support, and does not eliminate cat populations. So if we were going to just stop doing one of those things, since it's not helping, which would we stop? And what would be the cost of not stopping, and what would be the value of changing that practice in the United States? Not for cats and not for birds, but for the people that we entrust with caring for the most vulnerable animals in our society, that we ask to care for animals that are lost that are abandoned, that are the victims of cruelty and neglect, and who then we ask, just like I asked of myself, to go to work in the morning and euthanize healthy, free-roaming cats that have been brought in by members of the public. If we had evidence that that was actually going to protect birds, that was actually going to protect public health, that was actually going to serve any larger goal It would be a hard thing to ask, but we could ask it. But in the absence of any evidence that that serves any positive purpose, we need to challenge ourselves as a society to look at the data, to look at the evidence, even if it doesn't tell us what we wanted it to tell us, and make a choice that is not grounded in passion, but is grounded in reason, and lift this burden off of the shoulders of shelter staff. So, a lot of the things that have been on the table, that have been discussed and argued and debated for years and decades, and in some cases over a century, don't work. What else could we try? There's one more thing. A lot of you in the audience will be familiar with this, but it shocked me when I first heard about a program. This is in San Jose. They're trying a new approach. Instead of euthanizing those that aren't adoptable, the shelter spays or neuters them and releases them back to the vacant lot or back alley from which they came. It's not exactly TNR because it's not people who are bringing the cats in for sterilization surgery. It's people bringing all those cats in, the 95% of cats that exist in ones and twos and threes and back alleys and vacant lots and behind dumpsters. And it's not taking advantage just of the cat caregivers and the cat advocates in the community, but it's taking advantage of everybody who's annoyed by a cat pooping in their garden or just sees a cat without a collar on who happens to be concerned about it. So it's tapping into a much bigger pool of people and a much bigger group 
of cats. Now I'm going to ask one more poll question. And if you have a program like this at your shelter, don't answer, okay? This is really just for the people who haven't really heard how these programs have played out. I can tell you what I thought as a former animal control officer is like, you can't just put those cats back where you found them. You are going to be piled up to your neck in unwanted cats roaming around. So what do you think happened? Again, please uh, choose your answer on the screen. Euthanasia at the shelter went down. That's nice um, because the cats were just being returned. But more kittens were brought in. And more cats were found dead on the road, suggesting that we're, there were more cats out and about and more unwanted births. Or euthanasia at the shelter went down, and fewer cats were brought in, and fewer cats were found dead on the road, suggesting fewer cats out and about and fewer unwanted births. Or it didn't make a darn bit of difference, because just like all these other programs, it didn't affect enough cats. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about that one. All right, and we've got 90% of people voting for everything went down and 10% voting for it didn't make a darn bit of difference. So nobody sided with where I was, possibly because you've just endured 50 minutes of me droning on about this. <laughs> you probably guess where I'm going. Um, but here's how it played out. Oh, sorry, before I tell you how it played out, I want to share a theory of how this might play out. So we know from a variety of studies that about one in seven people in the United States feeds cats they don't own on purpose. And then in addition, we are aware that there are certain restaurants and dumpsters and so on that provide a food source for free roaming cats. So whether we like it or not, whether we outlaw it or not, there's going to be food sources available. And we know that litter-bearing mammals breed in proportion to the food source available in the habitat, right? Um, so let's just imagine if you will, that there's three female cats and the equivalent of six bowls of food available. And let's imagine for every bowl of food, each cat can have one kitten. And so the three cats split the six bowls and have two kittens each. And I have an R on the adult cats because they can transmit rabies because nobody's caught them and vaccinated them yet. And there's an R and a T on the kittens because we know that toxoplasmosis is an infection that's very significant in terms of public health and wildlife risk, as I mentioned at the beginning. And cats get infected the first time that they eat infected prey, and they shed oocysts for about two weeks after that, and then they develop significant immunity. So it's primarily a disease that's shed and spread by young cats. So what's going to happen if we remove one of the cats? About a third of the population is gone. Now, it doesn't matter what we do with her. We could adopt her out. We could send her to a farm. We could euthanize her. Do we have any fewer kittens being born? Have we reduced the risk? No, because we didn't remove the food from the environment. We didn't know where the food was when the person brought the cat in. We do not send out a SWAT team to identify the food and bring in those two bowls. So three bowls of food per cat, three kittens, world without end. We have done nothing. Okay, now watch closely because this is some fancy animation that I did. What if instead of removing that cat, we trapped her, we sterilized her, we vaccinated her, we ear tipped her, and we put her back? As long as she was in good body condition, her body condition told us that she knew where there was some food. And if we put her back pretty near that food, she'd just go back and keep eating it. Because we vaccinated her and sterilized her, she'd have a much better chance of surviving long term and holding that spot in the environment. Now how many kittens are born? Four instead of six. This is a theory, remember. This is not reality. This is just a mental exercise we're doing. But we have effectively lowered the reproductive carrying capacity of the environment. This is the first thing that we've done by returning cats sterilized that are in good body condition to go continue eating the food without adding any food or requiring a caretaker in the environment, we have actually succeeded in lowering the carrying capacity of the environment. That was the theory. 
Here is how this played out. This was a study that was published after San Jose's program had been in place for several years. Euthanasia was down 75%, yay, right? Greater public trust in the shelter, less cat abandonment, more willingness of people to work with us, if nothing else. Great for the shelter staff. Feels really different to work in a shelter where euthanasia has dropped by 75%, I can tell you that. But also, cats picked up dead on the road, down 20% with no change in field services. Intake, both cat and kitten, down 29%, an awful lot like what our mental model would have predicted. And this was even in a community where very low cost, $5 spay-neuter had been available for years and years and years for pet cats. So it was a really progressive community where we'd made the progress that was there to be made for pet cats. But this then had an additional impact on tackling that unowned free-roaming cat population that had been so hard to reach by any other means. And it turns out, as I mentioned before, managed is better than unmanaged. So if we could choose between magically no cats and no rats, that might be the better choice. But if we have to have cats, managed cats are better than unmanaged cats. This was work that came out of the UC Davis team that showed significantly lower prevalence of toxoplasmosis shedding for managed feral cats compared to unmanaged feral cats. So better for the otters. Better for those otters that I wanted to protect. So it seems like this is win, 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 right? It's a win for the shelters. It's a win for the public. It's a win for the cats. It's a win for the birds and for the other animals. It's the only thing that we've shown that at least provides some evidence that there's fewer free-roaming cats being born and out and about and running around and getting squished and causing havoc. Why are we still arguing about this? Why is, why is one shelter not allowed to do this practice? Why are we still funding with taxpayer dollars other practices? Why are there books being published called Cat Wars? Are you familiar with the backfire effect? It goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. We have some values that are so core to our identity that are so core to our sense of who we are. And it turns out, and this is so troublesome, that relevant facts do not affect beliefs that are core to our identity. And in fact, contradictory information, the information that I just presented over the last 50 minutes, actually strengthens those core identity beliefs. But when beliefs become widely accepted, individuals tend to become more accepting of corrective information. So if you are someone who listened to this talk and I persuaded you or you heard something at least that was interesting that prompted you to think about this in a different way and you can share this and you share it with someone who shares it, we can all become more accepting of information that I believe actually will lead us all to a better place. So here are my hopes. I hope that we, however much we love cats, can acknowledge the indisputable individual and potentially devastating population impact of cats on birds and other animals. And I hope we can respect and share the real sadness that we feel about the depletion of species and the harm suffered by individual animals due to cat predation. It's real. I hope we can all recognize, though, that in our open, complex, and fractured ecosystem, cat eradication is not an option on anything but the very smallest of scales. And so I hope that we can focus on solutions that mitigate harm and stabilize cat populations in a humane and sustainable way. And then I hope we can take all that energy that we have spent on arguing and debating and fighting and sending letters to the editor on practices that will really protect 
wildlife, whether that's preserving habitat or limiting harmful pesticide use, taking out your lawn, putting in wildlife-friendly gardens, feeding birds responsibly, preventing wildlife strikes, and so many other methods that are there for us to pick up if we can put down our weapons and actually start using them. So here's to common ground. I really think that there is a solution available to us that is better than any we could have hoped for and not as scary as a lot of us might have feared. Thank you, and we'll open it up now for questions. Whew, that was a roller coaster. Emotions and theories and data. <laughs> and you landed squarely at the top of the hour. Good job, Dr. Hurley. Um, but really quick, Dr. I want to make an announcement since it is right here at the top of the hour for anybody who has to jump off the call. Just know that your link to this um, webinar will be available tonight for the live performance. You can catch up on the Q&A, anything you miss here. Uh, we're going to take three questions since we know people have to scurry, and then we're going to continue the discussion over in the Maddie's Pet Forum. So um, right now, while we are going through these three questions, take a moment, visit www.millioncatchallenge.org, sorry, forward slash forum, and that will get you into the forum where we're going to take all of the questions that have been asked today. But Kate, we only have time for three, so are you ready? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought this was a 90-minute segment. Um, but yes, I am, I'm ready. I just want to remind our people, though, that um, the Million Cat Challenge Forum is for Million Cat Challenge members. So if you have additional uh, questions, go ahead and throw them into the discussion here, and I'll get to as many as I can. Does that sound fair? That sounds fair. Okay, so for our first question, it's actually two parts. I'm going to push the first part out to the audience and then just hold for one second for the second. So the studies just, that Hang on a second. I'm just saying goodbye to the vet students. Oh, that, that was interesting. Thanks for coming. I will see you later. Okay. Kate was giving this live on her And now back to our side. show. And now back to our show. Um, so the studies that extrapolation predation rates from birds are greatly disputed from A, a statistical validity level, and B, from the projected numbers vis-a-vis -vis the total population of birds in U.S. Can you comment? So that is absolutely true. The, the study that I referenced at the beginning and, and the studies on, on the impact of cat predation on birds and other wildlife um, have been extensively questioned, and you can even see from the range of studies that have concluded that the impact is from the hundreds of millions into the billions, that there's quite a bit of range even within the, the estimates that have been presented. But my point is that as we invest in trying to count how many cats um, or how many birds or how many critters are killed by cats, the question to ask first is, why does it matter? Will it change one thing that we do? Will that mean that okay, then we're going to buy an army of helicopters and dump rat bait across North America? Right. Is it going to mean that we're going to increase our shelter euthanasia budgets 150-fold and keep that up for the necessary years to, to eliminate this problem? If we can't meaningfully reduce cat populations by any method available to us except for return to field and TNR and other methods that are already acceptable for other reasons, in a sense, Range it doesn't matter if the estimate is 500 million or 2.5 billion. It right. does matter, but it doesn't inform the choices that we make about um, companion animal control practices in the United States. Very fair. Okay. So here's the second part of that. Predictive modeling of population with and without TNR rates depends on various variables, average litter size, litter's years, kitten survival rate, to reproductive age, average lifespan. Are you aware of any standardization of these? I'm not aware of any standardization of these models. Um, and I think that what we can say is what plays out in communities is so complex that there's a limit to the value of these models even except to tell us that it's going to be somewhere between very challenging to super duper challenging to eradicate cat or coyote populations on a large scale with lethal or non-lethal means. And I think what informs that more is both 
the true effort that it takes in these island studies where, geez, you know, on that, in that one island where they were live trapping the cats and removing to sanctuary, they got down to the last three cats and one of them was pregnant. So if they hadn't caught that one pregnant cat and they hadn't sustained that effort the next year, that population wouldn't have gone to zero. So the models really only go so far. And I think, again, as with the study, you know, as with the bird numbers, waiting to have a perfect model, waiting to know with certainty about the exact impact of cats on birds before we implement the, the methods that actually have promise, which largely have nothing to do with cats, just like the methods to protect livestock largely ended up having nothing to do with killing coyotes, it's not going to serve birds or cats or any of us well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, switching gears. How much does it cost to kill a cat in a shelter? I mean a feral cat who cannot be adopted. Wouldn't it be better to have TNR? Um, this is such a sad question to yeah. me. Um, yes. Because the answer is that it can be very low cost if you make very little effort to maintain the welfare of that cat. If you don't try to find a home for that cat, you know, if that cat is is just thrown into a stainless steel cage or as as was the case when I was an animal control officer, taken immediately to euthanasia, the cost in dollars in that moment is small although the cost in societal impact is high. So when you look at the actual cost of me shaking that cat down to, to euthanize her, that only took me 10 minutes and an injection that cost pennies. But the cost of me driving around in my big old animal control vehicle trying to help people with their cat nuisance problems, paying county gas and me being paid my hourly wage to set those traps and talk to those people and wonder why year after year after year after year we admitted the same number of kittens or more, um, that cost was high. <laughs> so if you try and pencil it out, it does cost more to spay a cat than to make no effort and euthanize a cat in the, on a cat-by-cat cat basis. But in the long run, um, sterilization and return can reduce intake, can reduce nuisance complaints, can reduce field services costs, and can make communities better and safer places that actually, in a way that's more cost-effective and also more likely to attract volunteer and donor dollars, so not as likely to have to be cost-carried entirely on the taxpayer dime. So these programs can be cost, very cost-effective and actually cheaper in the long run. An excellent point. Um, but Kate, how is the pooping in my garden stopped in my short term with putting the cat back after spay and neuter? So um, the pooping in the in the garden isn't, isn't stopped in your short term by putting the cat back in, in, after spay and neuter, but I'll, I'll go back to when I was an animal control officer. And when people called us about raccoons getting into their trash cans, we did not go and get the raccoon and take it back to the shelter mm -hmm. and either euthanize it or try and rehome it as Rocky Raccoon in somebody's barn, right? <laughs> not because we loved the raccoon so much, but because we knew that as long as there was an open garbage can mm -hmm. and there was raccoons somewhere around, raccoons were going to come back. And so we worked with the client to figure out how to solve the situation in a way that was more sustainable and long-term. And with cats, it's partly the same thing that we can help people solve their problems. If we're not at shelters busy rounding up and euthanizing cats, we can take the time to talk with them about cat deterrence and other ways to keep cats out of the yard. But also importantly, when we sterilize and return a cat, it will roam less, substantially less. And it may just become fat and lazy and go sit around in the backyard of the person who's actually feeding it or wherever the food source is and not come in someone's garden anymore. So oftentimes when people bring in cats and they don't want them sterilized in return, but they're asked to just give it a chance, they'll find that the nuisance problem surprisingly often abates on its own. And also that person down the street who is feeding two or three other intact cats, when their cat arrives back with an ear tip, and maybe a little door hanger that says, hey, this is our policy now in this community, and they see how much better off that cat is and how much less pee and yowling there is from that cat, maybe they'll take advantage of that program, and overall the problem will be abated in the long run. So this is why TNR programs, as well as return to field programs, are associated not with 
the increase in complaints that many of us from within the profession anticipated, but actually an overall reduction in complaints. What I've heard actually is that the complaints get uh, more detailed because people ex come to expect such a high level of service that they think that you can like magically solve all kinds of problems that you wouldn't be expected to solve in the past. Oop happens. Um, so Kate, here's a perfect segue to the next question. What about the people who don't want the cats back? How is animal control supposed to deal with them doing their job, but then the shelter puts the cats back and animal control has to deal with the backlash? Um, you know, so I was an animal control officer, <laughs> right, for, for six years. And um, we dealt with all kinds of backlash. We did all kinds of stuff that people didn't want. <laughs> In fact, lots of people didn't want us trapping and killing cats in truth, and I dealt with the backlash for that. I dealt with people who, who tried to take wow. my traps and destroyed them um, and who wrote nasty letters to the editor about what we do. Um, so we know that, in, in fact, we serve the whole community. We don't serve just the people who, who don't want cats around, but we serve the 85% of American citizens. Um, sorry, I've lost my signal here. Hopefully we're still here. Um, <laughs> we serve the 85% of American citizens who, who who really don't love lethal control methods. And so we're actually providing a service that is more likely to appeal to a greater range of our community members. But also importantly, it's usually not that people don't want the cat there. They don't want the problem there. Problems. And so shelters can work with people to solve the problem. Again, whether that's giving people a deterrent to keep the cat out of their yard or seeing if sterilization actually makes the cat roam less, helping to figure out who in the neighborhood is feeding and attracting cats and having talking to them about doing that in a more responsible way, not putting out excess food to attract not only neighborhood cats but also wildlife. So there are other ways to solve the problem. So instead of saying, let's get rid of this cat for you, where the inciting cause will still be there, let's talk about ways to solve the problem for you and support animal okay. control officers in doing that. We have a great webinar on the Million Cat Challenge website that's from an animal control officer who worked with his community in going through that transition. Thank you, Dr. Kate. Has SNR been implemented elsewhere besides San Jose? Oh, that's a great question. And in fact, I'm aware of over 100 communities where this has been implemented. And I speak about it as if it's a new program, but it's really a program that's, that's about a decade old now. And at this point, I would, I would be comfortable saying at least hundreds of thousands of cats have been processed through these programs. I'm aware of them ranging from the southern tip of Florida all the way up into the southern provinces of Canada. So in every climate, in every region, in rural and urban communities, and in shelters of every size, these are now long-standing and well-established programs, so, so we're not talking about something that's really super cutting edge at this point. And Kate, can you take just one moment and explain what is the difference between SNR and TNR? Um, so we use various acronyms to describe uh, what I talked about, about taking the cats that are brought into the animal control facility or animal shelter and sterilizing them and returning them. So we use return to field or RTF or sometimes SNR or shelter, neuter, return to describe those programs and distinguish them from trap, neuter, and return. And what distinguishes them is the role of the shelter. So trap, neuter, return doesn't involve a shelter, or it might involve a shelter spay neuter clinic, but the cat is, is brought in specifically for sterilization services, where a return to field or shelter neuter return program is any cat that's brought into the shelter by an animal control officer or a member of the public for whatever reason, and it's sterilized and then returned to the location found, either by the person who found it or by the shelter or by a rescue or volunteer partner. Thank you for clarifying. How do I get these policies in my community? They took cats out of the bylaws, so you can't even complain about cats. It goes nowhere. <laughs> um, post that if you're, if you're part, with a Million Cat Challenge shelter, post that question to, million, to the Million Cat Challenge discussion forum. You can hear from many, many shelters that have faced the same problem that you have. And if you're not a member of the Million Cat Challenge, email us at info at milliongatchallenge.org. And if we don't have the resources for you, we can certainly put you in touch with some recommended resources and webinars on that subject specifically, because certainly there have many, been many, many communities that have successfully made these changes. And it's because the intent of the law is what we all want, which is to reduce nuisances caused by cats, 
to reduce suffering and problems experienced by cats and to reduce issues caused by cats. And we know that these programs are the best way to accomplish that, and that's, that's the intent of the law. Can you elaborate on non-native and invasive, specifically the U.S. FWS definitions and those repeated by the Smithsonian that prompt advocating for killing of cats? Um, no, I can't. <laughs> I'm not I'm not deeply I'm not deeply familiar with it. Uh, but I think again I'm going to come back to this. The important issue is who is going to be doing this killing at a scale sufficient to actually reduce rather than increase and destabilize cat populations. When we recognize that even on tiny islands it takes an effort spanning years and costing in the tens of millions of dollars and involving extensive use of poisoning, hunting, lethal trapping, and other methods that would not be acceptable in the United States or in any community, really, where people and pets and children are cohabitating. So we can – there is advocating of the killing of cats, but then there's where the rubber meets the road, and the main way that cats are killed in response to this advocacy, truthfully, is by euthanizing them in animal shelters. That's the truth in the United States. That's the way the vast majority of cats are killed. And so if we can just tackle that end of the question and say, you know what, we have a better policy that's available for animal shelters and for communities to ask of their animal sheltering facilities, then um, we can meet that question with a better answer. Kind of like when your kid keeps asking you for a chocolate pie, and you don't want them to have a chocolate pie, but you have a nice peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You give them the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it assuages their hunger, and it's better for them in the long run. I think for those of us who are, no, I know there's a mixed audience listening to this, but for those of us who are part of the animal welfare profession, we need to get clear and be clear on what works and, and understand we're not offering it just because we love cats, even if it's true that we love cats and we want to advocate for it for cats, we're offering it because it's the best imperfect solution mm -hmm. that we have. And we would like to protect wildlife too, and it turns out the best imperfect solution is also the best way we have to protect those native species. Dr. Hurley, we have no free roaming bylaws in some of our municipalities. Is it fair to say that we wouldn't even, that we would have to change bylaws in order to implement RTS? Um, I'm sorry, can you say that question again? Sure. We have no free roaming bylaws in some of our municipalities. Is it fair to say that we would have to change bylaws in order to implement RTS? So I think the question is, if you have a bylaw, you know, or a local ordinance pre prevent it, that says that cats can't be free roaming, then you can't. You know, the question is, can you do return to field? And I can say there are plenty of return to field programs that exist in communities that also have bylaws that cats, pet cats, have to be kept confined. Because ultimately, the bylaw applies to owners of cats, right? Cats can't obey laws. And you don't become the owner of a cat by sterilizing the cat and returning it to its habitat. And in fact, again, you are helping with the intent of the bylaw, which is to reduce the amount of free-roaming cats and the problems associated with free-roaming cats in the community. And we see that this is the only program where we actually have evidence that this has succeeded in reducing shelter intake, in reducing cats hit by cars, and reducing the evidence of free-roaming cats. And there's some good documentation from Best Friends Animal Society. If you can't find it easily, you can email us again at info at um, millingcatchallenge.org to get a legal analysis of the intent of cat abandonment and free roaming bylaws and their impact on return to field type programs. Um, if there, uh, yeah, there's anyone from Best Friends or Alley Cat Allies listening in on this who have other suggested resources, if you can put those in the discussion forum at Million Cat Challenge or let us know about what other resources you suggest, there's quite a good body of work now um, documenting that these are acceptable practices and documenting these practices in the face of various bylaws around free roaming cats and abandonment. Dr. Hurley, how can we get people to treat every bird as a sentient being the way they do with every cat? Do you have ideas? Many cats are 
not good ratters. So you could argue that each bird is more important part of the ecosystem than non-native cats. Um, and I would say that, so, so the question is, how do we get tr people to treat every bird as a sentient being the way we do with every cat? Um, and we could, we could argue all day about who's more important, non-native cats, native birds, non-native humans, native humans. The truth is, though, again, we don't have a choice that's cruel to cats and kind to birds. Hmm. It turns out, cruelly and randomly, killing cats, it didn't protect birds. And scientists who hate cats and hate to admit that publish that with more conviction than scientists who are cat advocates. And I do think that, and, and this, is the, this is the calculus I made. The calculus I made was that the life of a sea otter was more valuable than the life of a cat. And I love cats. Um, when I thought that that was a choice that could be made, but what I believe now is the way we treat every sentient being as valuable is by treating every sentient being as valuable, valuable. and refusing to accept a mm -hmm. compromise or a practice that values the life of one sentient being over another, whether that's a native or a non-native species or a native or a non-native human being. We do the best we can to meet the needs of everyone in the kindest way that we can and in accepting imperfect solutions, we come closer than we otherwise could to doing the best for everybody. Ah, that's such a beautiful answer to that question. How do the shelters decide which cats to SNR or adopt out? That varies depending on the shelter. So one of the things we know is that this is sort of an aside, um, but we know that Free roaming cats, free roaming pet cats that are lost by their owners are 10 times more likely to get back to their owners if they're left in the neighborhood where they were lost or if they're returned to the neighborhood where they were lost. So one other important mission of animal shelters, aside from controlling cat populations and protecting other species, is to reunite lost pets with their owners. And so some shelters that believe in that mission and also just believe in the, in the sort of the the theory that I showed that putting cats back sterilized is the best way of reducing reproductive care and capacity and stabilizing populations. Do this for all free roaming cats that come in in good body condition, whether they're friendly or whether they're feral at any level. And um, have found that that's been successful in, you know, to some degree lowering intake and lowering nuisance complaints and really educating the community about how to manage free roaming cats by the very real experience of having an ear-tipped cat appear in your midst and finding out it's not as much of a hassle as it was to have around. There are other shelters where they have plenty of homes for friendly cats, and so some of the friendly free-roaming cats, they do place up for adoption, and they reserve return to field for, the, for, for feral and fearful cats that aren't doing well in the shelter environment, which can be a fine choice, too. I think consistently shelters don't return cats where there's an extraordinary danger to the cat or where there's evidence that the cat is really at particular risk. For instance, it's, it was taken from a place where the, the warehouse where it was living is, is just about to be torn down or there's a credible threat that somebody's been poisoning animals in the area or something like that. And what would you do in that circumstance? And in that circumstance, you know, when you return, when you return all the healthy cats that aren't where there's not a big danger, Turns out then, then it becomes much more possible to find good outcomes in working cat homes or blue collar cat homes where cats are really wanted, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a lab cat. Uh, Kate, I feel like you sort of answered this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway in case you have any additions to this question. What type of challenges might be faced when implementing some of these policies in terms of financial ramifications or resource management? Um, so, as I said, um, the startup, you know, oftentimes if you're having, if you're taking in 30% fewer cats and you're having fewer nuisance complaints and fewer cats picked up dead on the road, that can be a long-term savings for an organization. But the startup costs, you know, there certainly can be startup costs, and especially if you're not a shelter that has your own in-house surgery program. So for a shelter with an in-house surgery program, the beauty of cats 
is uh, for you veterinarians in the audience, you know that sterilizing cats is pretty easy and it's really fun. Um, <laughs> especially if I may say, neutering male cats. It takes two minutes. <laughs> And so it's something that it can be sometimes possible to pilot and just sort of absorb into the regular surgery schedule. But if you're a shelter that doesn't have that luxury of having an on-staff veterinarian, you can't sneak these into the shelter, even maybe like start in the wintertime when the load is a lot lower and you're not inundated with kittens. Um, two approaches. One approach, of course, is to try and get grant funding. And even a small amount of grant funding it's one of those things that, like, once you start to get out from under the eight ball of all these feral cats and euthanizing cats and too many cats and everybody's miserable because there's cats everywhere, it becomes easier both you get more community support so you can get more donations to support it, um, and it can be easier to get grants, and just overall you can find ways to decrease your other workload. For instance, in San Jose, in that paper, I didn't show it on the slide because it wasn't pertinent to the main argument, but their euthanasia due to upper respiratory infection decreased by 99%. That was a Whoa. huge impact on a decreased workload. Just by getting those miserable cats out of the yeah. system quickly, they dramatically lowered their upper respiratory infection. And then by getting cats out of the system quickly, they also were able to portalize their cages. So the cats that stayed, stayed healthier and stayed less time. So there's lots of ways in which starting it can trigger a cascade of decreased costs and better outcomes. But there are other ways that shelters have dealt with it, too. Another way is to implement a stray cat impound fee. You, you, we now recognize that people aren't doing a service to society by going around and picking up feral and stray cats. And, you know, they're actually doing less of a service to society than they are by adopting cats or by having cats TNR or by getting their own pets sterilized. We're comfortable charging a fee for surrendering your cat, for spaying your cat, for adopting a pet. And so just charge a fee for it that's enough to cover the cost of the surgery. Mm -hmm. And, again, we're blessed with cats because it's a relatively low cost. It's not usually hundreds of dollars. Um, so that can be a way to fund it. And then the final option is to just say, well, we don't have a good outcome for feral cats, and we know that bringing them in is actually destabilizing the age structure in the community and making there be more cats at the places where they're removed. And so we're not going to accept feral cats. Mm -hmm. um, and I've known of some shelters that went that route, and then into that void sprang a TNR group to actually take on the responsibility. And so they just instead of they bypass the shelter ent entirely. People call the shelter, they refer them to the TNR group, and they don't ever come in the shelter's door. So maybe a longer answer than you wanted, but there you have it. Three options. No, it was great, but it does remind me we have two minutes left, so we're going to do three questions, and then we really are moving over to the forum. Lightning questions. <laughs> Lightning questions. And I think this one is actually just more of an agreement. The principles that you explained about culling are identical to those I have worked with regarding canine rabies control and badger control in the UK. How we have to, I think it means, why do we have to relearn this principle over and over again for different species and issues? Yeah, and I, don't, I hope you can push this question to the screen so people who are still here. Um, it's, it's, it's such a great question. The principles about culling are identical. They're mm. identical. We know this so well. And I was talking about I was talking about this with a wild uh, with a bird guy who is a really nice guy, really smart guy. And I said, you know, like, can you give us permission to to stop euthanizing cats in shelters? You're like, just knowing that a drop in the bucket not only doesn't it doesn't do good, but it can actually do harm. And he's like, as long as I have to put up with what's happening to birds. I know it's only a drop in a bucket, but I want that drop in the bucket. Yeah. And he was honest about it. And I think it just yep. speaks to how deeply felt it, the desire to protect birds is. And it, it's, not, it's not something that gets us at a mental level. It's something that gets us at a really deep visceral All level. Right. And it feels fair. It feels like, if I dare say it, it feels like an eye for an eye. You know, mm -hmm. the cats kill the birds, we kill the cats. It feels like at least we're doing something. It's very counterintuitive to believe if you remove 30%, there's not going to be 30% fewer. There's actually going to be 200% more. It's so counterintuitive. It is counterintuitive. Okay, two more. Do we know how many days a cat can be gone from his or her home area before being able to integrate back to that community? successfully 
This is a great question, um, yes. and if you can advance the slides. Um, yep. This is something that we've discussed in the Million Cat Challenge discussion forums. Um, there's a lot of comfort with keeping cats up to two weeks, although I would say that like it's miserable for the cat. So if there's any possibility that you can turn them around within a day or two or three, that's definitely ideal. But if for whatever reason the cat has some injury that needs to be monitored or you catch the cat and then a blizzard comes along and you're holding on to it, shelters certainly have returned them um, as long as two to three weeks after capture, and some shelters have, have reported returning them, I know, at least six to, six to eight weeks that I can remember. Um, and people who have experience with returning cats also say, like, you can kind of tell when you try to return them whether they know actually <laughs> where they're going or not. And cats do have quite a memory for place, as we've seen in a lot of the stories that we hear about cats, like getting on a truck and getting shipped across town and then making their way back to making their, their home, home turf. Last what one. about RTF? Last one. What about the RTF of two to three pound kittens? Or what is the minimum age for RTF SNR? So um, a lot of programs have a minimum age for SNR of 12 weeks because that's the week at which a uh, rabies vaccine um, can be given with some expectation of success or some at least um, sort of accepted that it will be protective. Um, and certainly... Kittens under two to three pounds are at much greater risk if they are returned and less likely to be sort of adapted to the habitat where they are found. So if there's a possibility of either waiting until the kittens are older for them to be trapped or if they're young enough to be socialized and socializing them and prioritizing your rehoming efforts for those kittens, that's really ideal. I've certainly seen it happen where it was 10-week-old kittens and, mm. oh, gosh, they were brought in by a board member. <laughs> <laughs> and they were too old to be socialized, and they were just a little too young to be returned to field, but it clearly wasn't an advantage to anyone to try and raise them in the shelter where they were just hissing and biting everybody. And so they were sterilized and returned um, with, you know, ideally with more monitoring than you would, you would have when you're returning an adult cat. Dr. Hurley, we want to thank you so much for this very thoughtful presentation today and for all the wonderful questions. You still have uh, over a dozen left to go. So just want to oh, remind gosh. everybody, uh, yes, Dr. Hurley will be in the Maddie's Pet Forum Million Cat Challenge discussion group. So head on over there if you didn't get your question answered. If you want to continue in this discussion, there's more to be said. In the green uh, resource widget on the bottom, Please look down there. You'll find the link to these notes. You'll find the link to these slides. Um, and everything you need is down there in the widget. You do not have to be a member of the Million Cat Challenge to be on the Maddie's Pet Forum, only in the Million Cat Challenge um, private discussion group. But come on over and check out Maddie's Pet Forum. There's lots of great channels, something there for everybody. Dr. Hurley, thank you for your time today. Thank you, everybody, and especially everybody who's endured it to the bitter end here. And thank you all for the great work that you're doing. Have a great afternoon. Have a great day out there.